Today, we discuss Miro. Listen, when it comes to running client workshops, the dream, of course, is to get those creative juices flowing, right? But typically what ends up happening is thousands of hours get wasted because of poorly facilitated meetings. So I have Maya with me today. She's a consultant who runs Fortune 100 workshops from leadership training to team building, and she has the insider tip on what makes things work. Maya? Thank you, Jason. I've been doing this a long time. My number one tip is to bring everyone into that visual collaboration platform. So personally, I use Miro and it's completely changed how I interact with the room. You have to give people a way to feel like they're in the room, even when they're not. That's something you can do easily in Miro. Otherwise, they've seen the same slides and format a thousand times. Falling asleep, eyes glazing over, yawns, all that. Exactly. When people follow me on the Miro board, everyone is literally going on a journey with me. We're adding thoughts, we're reacting, and we're voting for the best ideas. It's great. Connective magic. I like it. That's M I R O dot com. Why don't more infant formula companies use organic, grass fed whole milk instead of skim? Why don't more infant formula companies use the latest breast milk science? Why don't more infant formula companies run their own clinical trials? Why don't more infant formula companies use more of the proteins found in breast milk? Why don't more infant formula companies have their own factories instead of outsourcing their manufacturing? We wondered the same thing. So we made Byheart a better formula for formula. Learn more at byheart.com. You're finally at that hot new spot, the one your friends keep raving about, sitting across from your date. It's going... Another round? Really well. And that dish you've been dying to try, oh, it's headed your way. You can smell it, hear it sizzling fresh off that skillet as it comes closer, closer, and served. Go ahead, enjoy. After your phone sneaks a bite first... When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Storyworthy Media. The best in story-driven content. This is David Wilde, and I finally made it. I'm Storyworthy. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Finney. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn and I'm here with Hannah Finney. And once again, we come to you from the grounds of Summerfest in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the world's greatest music festival. And I bet you we're coming from Summerfest because Van Morrison, I'm sure, has played this venue. Everybody, every musician in the world, at least America, has played Summerfest. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that our guest has even heard of it, if not been there. But oh, we'll I'm find sure out about that later. So I'm sure he has because you guys, our guest tonight, we're so excited to have him here in the studio. David Wild is here. And David Wild, I'm telling you, Hannes, if you think about, if you know anything about music, and I know you don't. I don't. But if you did, you would know that this guy is one of the most prolific writers of rock music and about rock music and has written for Rolling yeah, Stone Yeah, I don't ever years. listen to music, but I do like to read about it. Yeah, and I'm... Bl- so I find that very entertaining. Well, you do read a lot, though, right? I have... I, no, I used to. He's written. He used to write. He writes for everything. But he writes for Rolling Stone magazine. Even I used to read Rolling Stone yeah, magazine back so. in the day, as the kids say. And so he's done some fantastic uh, interviews with some amazing musicians, and has also been a music critic. And you can see him a lot of times on those shows, like, um, you know, Behind the Music or the E True Hollywood Story stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Do you watch those, Hannes? Yes, yes, I have watched that. I don't want to know the truth. I want to see <laughs> the lie, the untruth behind the music. Oh, Just I lies see. and lies and lies and I lies. I see. You want to see in front of the music. In front of the music. I want to see why are we listening to the music? Can we just all well, just listen, have a this nosh? Is, this is exciting tonight to talk about Van Morrison. I have to say, I can't, you know, now I that, can't say enough about how much I love Van Morrison music. And I think a lot of people are with me on this. because. Right. But not his, only, his title is The Worst Interview Ever colon, My Bad Moon Dance with Van Morrison. That's right. So That's the title of the, the Of his actual the story. So this may not be a positive experience for him. No, I'm talking about Van Morrison's music. Yes. It's just phenomenal. Okay, one time I saw Van Morrison at the Hollywood Bowl do his entire concert album of Astro Weeks, and that was one of the best concerts I've ever seen. 
Yeah. And that is like such an experience as a music lover to hear the songs that you love and uh, and just just see it done so well and yeah, that's Van yeah. Morrison for you uh, but like you said the title of the tonight show gives off a, a different vibe about Van Morrison well he's not talking about listening to Van Morrison which he's he may about, very well yeah, enjoy he's talking about interviewing Van Morrison which is interesting because it also goes back to the fact that like we've had musicians on this show and musicians you know because they do one thing well doesn't mean they do other things well and right. so Van Morrison is an example of like not, as I understand, not being a very good person. Like a, he doesn't yeah. sound like a, a good he, – he, he's not a good interviewee. He doesn't like to be interviewed. He doesn't seem to like his fans. Yeah, that's always a weird thing. Like people will be like, you know, I don't like to be interviewed. Well, then don't be interviewed. But the thing with Van Morrison is I've heard so many times over and over and over from different people that he's just a really – not nice person that he's kind of a bad person and i'm sure that there are you know there must be millions i guess it's it's weird because i guess i don't find that that strange like i always find it strange when you hear about somebody met a very famous person and they were the nicest person you Wait could a minute, ever wait, but I hear that all the time. Like, you know, Henry Winkler has an amazing reputation in town about being the nicest guy in the world. People say Tom Cruise is the greatest guy in the world. But if you say Van Morrison, and in fact— Tom Hanks punched my dog in the face. <laughs> Tom Hanks is another one that everybody has a good word to say about. Yeah, but there's but all Van sorts of other Morrison, people. You're like, this guy's a prick. This guy's this. No, but there's something specific about this man, Van Morrison. And if you Google him, I will tell you the top 10 articles that come up okay. about him. Here it is. Yeah. Van Morrison, are there any positive stories? <laughs> Van Morrison, the biggest jerk in rock. Is Van Morrison a jerk? If Van Morrison is a jerk, does that make Brown Eyed Girl any worse? <laughs> Van Morrison hates his fans. So in other words, this guy has like a full-on reputation. What I'm really finding is that uh, I want to uh, correlate I want to. I'm going to Google Van Morrison jerk. Yeah. And see, right? That seems to be the specific word that keeps coming up here. Yeah. I, so we'll find out. But I actually, I, I guess I can see on one hand him thinking, you know, I don't want to give interviews. I want to do my craft. I want to do my music, write my song, produce my music, and then I want to let it go and put it aside. And that's just something I did. You know, like if you write a book, you put it aside right. and it's done. Or you make a painting and you put it aside and it's done. And then people want you to keep repeating it. And maybe that. But see, but you're thinking of it like maybe there's a legitimate reason I am that he's coming of that. off as a jerk. Yeah. But maybe he's just a jerk who can make good music. Yeah. I don't know, but it's like him being a dick might have absolutely nothing to do with his talent. Yeah. People are always like, it has to it's like, no, maybe he's you know, some guy if some guy was an exceptional carpenter and a jag off, you would never have heard of him. And nobody would be like, I can't believe this guy. Sure, he can make a table. But he has no personal skills. It's like, but that you don't hear about it. This guy hap maybe happens to be incredibly talented musically, and is just a jerk. Yeah, I recently went hiking with this friend of mine, Julie, and she was actually in a oh, that bitch in a recording <sighs> studio with Van Morrison, and his daughter, Van's daughter, was there, and she says that he yelled and berated his daughter so hard and so badly that like everybody left, like everybody had to like leave. They couldn't listen to it anymore. See, now that's a mentally ill person to me. That's not a jerk. So maybe he, that's a person with mental. It. But can't problems. we just think about Tupelo Honey and just all get along? You know See, what I mean? See, after Van, after Brown Eyed Girl, you already lost. I did. I don't know. I don't know That's what Tupelo so Honey is. That's really upsetting. The Philosopher's Stone is one of my favorite albums of all time by Van Morrison. That is such a good. You album can't see this at back. podcasting at home, but I'm giving her a blank stare. <laughs> Well, listen, we're excited David Wilde is here. and he's, He is he's not tell a jerk. Us this story about Van Morrison. And then I have so many other questions about some amazing interviews he's done with people like Bill Maher and Lucinda Williams, Keith Richards, Ringo Starr, Eddie Van Halen, Johnny Depp. I mean, the guy, David Wilde has met Johnny so many Depp. people. Johnny Depp. That guy still owes me 10 bucks. <laughs> And now he's here. So, folks, before David comes on and tells his story, I did want to remind you that if you'd like to support the Storyworthy podcast, you should do that. If you don't, you are a Van Morrison-sized jerk. Here's what you can do. You can buy my book, Pit to LAX, My Storyworthy Life. Head over to storyworthypodcast.com or storyworthymedia.com and you'll find my right. book. Or you can go to patreon.com slash storyworthy. You could perhaps give us money directly. Yeah, it's you happened do that. before. It has happened before. Many, many friends. Should we name our supporters? Uh, I think Should we've we... already done that recently. Well, we could name them again. Okay, go you ahead. Know, all right. Uh, Dave Sheckman, come on down. <laughs> Stu Gillickson, Patty Woods, Lisa Allen, Amanda Raven, and of course, Dan Swallow and Jay Cock. 
Swallow and Cock. That's the only The old reason. vaudeville team of Swallow. That's the only reason I wanted to thank them is because I say, <laughs> or as somebody said earlier, it's not Swallow and Cock. It's Cock and Swallow. Obviously, I obviously, if they were a <laughs> musical team, they would be Cock and Swallow. And why not head on over to storyworthypodcast.com and click on our Amazon ad before you do all that Christmas shopping that you're about to do. Yeah. Because that would give us a few pennies Just a as taste. Well. We get a little taste. It doesn't come out of your pocket. And folks, if you'd like to receive a short email from me every Monday morning, go ahead and join our mailing list. You can find that at storyworthypodcast.com as That's well. That's storyworthypodcast.com. All right, you guys, wherever you are, stick around because David Wilde is on his way here. Next time on Storyworthy, we have director and producer Candace Jordan. I will be talking about my you film Girl take... and how I followed a DJ around the world. That's next time on Storyworthy. Put it in a big brown. Hey, you guys, come on down and see Storyworthy live at the Improv on Thursday, December 4th. That's right. It's a brand new thing for us. We're doing a happy hour show, 530 on December 4th at the Improv on Melrose, one of the greatest clubs in all of Los Angeles. That's right. So come on down, see the show. And afterwards, Hannes and I will hang out with you guys in the bar and we'll drink draft beer. Yes, I won't speak to you or make eye contact, but I will be there. So come on down, you guys, Thursday night, December 4th at the Improv on Melrose. Hey, it's Lee Keckner, and you're listening to Story Worthy. We're so happy you're here. And we're back. You we're can't stop the press us. Grounds. We've actually the headed to the comedy stage. Uh, used to be when I was a kid, you the comedy stage us. was right next to the big I amphitheater. You know, so you'd be watching Jay Leno and Eric Clapton would be playing, Man and that didn't work out so well. So then eventually they moved the amphitheater Man down to the southern end, mm-hmm. and they took the comedy stage with it. <laughs> Just because what you want is like a guy going up against Pink Floyd when he's trying to go. So then I went and I bought some tuna. And, uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense. They should have left the comedy stage where it was. Well, and why? Well, I thought Summerfest was a music festival, but uh, why did they throw in comedy too? Because they figure only one time in the whole goddamn year people are coming to Wisconsin. We better show them everything we have. That's pretty much it. You couldn't, yeah, you couldn't get a job at like the regular comedy clubs for those two weeks. All right, you guys. David Wilde is here right now. He is a twice Emmy nominated television writer, a New York Times best selling author, and a contributing editor for Rolling Stone. David is also here. This is interesting. He's also the most frequent guest ever in the history of the popular Adam Carolla Show podcast. How about that, Hannes? It is. I've heard him many times on there. I imagined him a little taller. Oh, is that right? Interesting. Yeah. David may also be the only Jewish American writer to ever win a Muslim Public Policy Award <laughs> with Cat Stevens and to write for Pope Francis's recent mass event at Madison Square Garden. How about that? Wow, he is all over the place. And he has a new series on Fandango with Phil Rosenthal. It's called Naked Lunch. He takes famous people out to lunch. How about that? That is the greatest. And Phil Rosenthal, for those who don't know, creator of Everybody Loves Raymond. That's right. Amazing guy. All right, you guys. David Wilde's here right now. You can find him on Twitter at WildAboutMusic. Wherever you are, put your hands together for David Wilde. Thank you, thank you. This is a story of how I became a recovering journalist. This is what I had to recover from. Uh, it's 1990. I'm the music editor of Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, I am 27, something like that, and uh, arrogant, uh, you know, with the job because the internet hasn't come around and destroyed journalism. Being the music editor of Rolling Stone is actually an amazingly privileged position position for any age but definitely at my age i was just not that long out of college and i just had this crazy early luck in my career it went to crap later but i'm sitting in my office one day and i get a call from uh van morrison's record company van had not done an interview with rolling stone or pretty much anybody for years in particular he hated rolling stone because in his opinion there had been an article that had begun with a lead that gave directions to his house uh, and he didn't like that, which made sense, but I don't think the article actually gave directions to his house. But uh, I get the call saying, Van has agreed to do an interview with Rolling Stone for his new greatest hits record, and he'll only do it with you, David Wilde. And I was even more, I, I, was, I went to 5'7", based on the short joke. Uh, I was so, I felt uh, up from 5'6". And uh, I was thrilled. So then what proceeded to happen was in journalistic terms, uh, just uh, like Vietnam. I spent the next few weeks 
being told, okay, he wants you to fly to Dublin, and then they'd cancel. We'd get plane tickets. Then it was come out to L.A., cancel. Finally, I'm told, okay, Van can't wait to see you, uh, and he will see you at the David Letterman show. He wants to really just get to know you a little bit at the David Letterman show, which uh, then was on air. This is all those years ago. And I came down to the Letterman show, and this manager – Right before he's about to introduce me to Van Morrison says, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to tell him I went to high school with you. Uh, just go along with that. And I went, what? And then Van comes off stage and he goes, Van, this is my friend David from high school. And Van looked at me, looked, ran the other way, and that was my introduction to Van Morrison. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? And I, 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 so that was the beginning. Then I got a call going, oh, Van was really so happy to meet you. Uh, he really wants you to come to Boston. Uh, and I flew to Boston, checked into a great hotel, because journalism in those days could pay for great hotels. Mm -hmm. So I think I was on the Four Seasons or something like that. And I'm there for the first show, for the second show, for a third show, for a fourth show. I'm seeing great shows. I'm seeing okay shows. But I'm not talking to Van Morrison. And I'm running up a tremendous amount of expense for Rolling Stone, which <laughs> could sustain it. But uh, I have nothing to show for it. Finally, it's the last show. And I go to the manager and I go, this is, I'm leaving town. This is ridiculous. He goes, no, no. After the show tonight, he's going to have a, fans having a party at the Hard Rock Cafe. How cool was that? Uh, and uh, he goes you come to the party and we're going to talk he, Van's going to talk to you after that uh, I go to the party and Van is sitting standing by himself over a chafing dish inhaling chicken wings and egg rolls and grease there's no napkins anywhere he's just like his. it, it was like he was like a starving man at a bar mitzvah it was just it, I don't know what was going on and that was the moment where the manager said Van, this is David Wilde, who you're going to talk to. Van started to shake my hand. And when I say start, I mean we went up in the shake, and but before it could go down, and I'm, I already have egg rolls and chicken wings in my hand, he darts into the hallway, runs away from me, <laughs> mid-shake. And I see him, and he's sitting with uh, standing in the hallway with Georgie Fame, who was a legendary sort of keyboardist and British musician who was in his <laughs> band at the time. And I'm like... What just happened? And the manager goes, don't worry. Here's what you do. Just go out in the hall, walk back in front of Van for a little while. Let him get comfortable with you. And I went, what do you mean? Should I lift my hind leg and see if Van wants to mount me? I don't know what – like, this is not usually how interviews go. This is uh, – so I actually did it. I went in the hall walking back in front, parading in front of Georgie Fame and Van Morrison. Georgie looked confused. Van looked utterly disinterested. And I said, fuck this, I'm going. Uh, and I went to the manager and I said, okay, I'm leaving. This is absurd. At which point, thank God, I guess, uh, Peter Wolf of the Jay Giles Band, uh, the front man of the Jay Giles Band, uh, was at this party. He was the only person uh, at the party besides the band. And he I knew Pete uh, from the office. He'd been around. He's a friend of Jan Wenner's. And I explained what was going on. And uh, for those, a little deep rock history, Peter Wolf was a DJ before he was like a rock star in Boston around the time that Van was of Astral Weeks and Van spent some time in Boston. So I told him what was going on. He goes, oh, I'll, I'll fix this. Like I, like I thought that was going to be easy. But he did. He walked over to Van. They talked for a few minutes. And he came back. Uh, and he went, all right, we'll have lunch then. And that was progress. That was so the next day I didn't I didn't check out. I didn't go home. And uh, the next day we literally reserved. We found out what Van's favorite restaurant in Cambridge was. We reserved the back room of the restaurant. We briefed the staff on not to look at him, not to talk to him. We had Matt Mahurin, who was a world-famous photographer. You know, he had just done the album cover for Tracy Chapman's out record, if you think of that. He's a great photographer. He was supposed to do a session with Van. He was being blown off, too. So they arranged for him to be in the corner of the room, like hidden behind a curtain, so that he could try to take a picture of Van talking to me to document that this really, this hell was really happening. So I sat there, and it, 
I, I guess those I was kind of a little bit more uh, into preparing then for things. And I had a list of maybe 200 questions. Oh, my uh, I was ready. I got, and we were gonna, it was a career retrospective of the Rolling Stone interview, which is like your life story. Yeah. Uh, so I started to ask my first question. I looked up and Van was running out of the restaurant. <laughs> and when I say running, I mean waddling. And I thought for a second... This is a poet, you know, as Christine was saying, one of my favorite artists of all time, someone who touches me on a spiritual level. But I realized he's also being a fucking douchebag. So I am going to chase this guy. And I grab my notebook and my tape recorder, which we didn't couldn't use an iPhone back then. Uh, you know, used a big bulky tape recorder and cassettes. And I chased him through Harvard Square. So a kid in, you know, some Harvard kids probably in 1990 remember like this strange scene of like a mad butcher uh, van running through Harvard Square being chased by me then being chased by Matt Mahurin with his cameras <laughs> and van ducked into a cafe like a block and a half away and I just sat down next to him I uh, like nothing had happened and Matt Mahurin was outside the window of the restaurant. I think he was afraid of getting hurt. So he was outside the restaurant, like through the window with his camera. Uh, and I sat down and I pulled out my notebook and I asked my first question, which was, when you, I got as far as when you, and he goes, I don't talk about my personal life. And I looked at my questions and there were about, you know, 200 about his life. Uh, or anything that could be construed as a personal life, because I had only said, when you. And then I said, okay. So I looked at some album-related questions, and I go, on the album, because I don't talk about my records. <laughs> and I thought, I am fucking dealing with a crazy person. Uh, this is, uh, and if I'm dealing with a crazy person, how do you deal with a crazy person? I said, well, I've seen movies. I know like Judd Hirsch played a shrink in Ordinary People. I'll, I'll play shrink. And so I literally sort of sat back like I was a shrink. And I said, Van, let's talk about why you don't want to talk to me. And that was the first thing that grabbed him. He was really happy to tell me why he didn't want to talk to me. And that was the window that was all you know, Van has a song, Cleaning Windows. That was the window I had to clean to start a conversation. And for the next hour, beginning talking about why he didn't want to talk to me, but eventually actually talking to me, he gave me what was a pretty good interview, good enough to be, you know, I'm sitting here looking at a Rolling Stone, like, greatest interviews issue. And it, it made the, even though it was only an hour and the most difficult hour probably of my professional life, uh, it made it, 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 he gave me an interview, and at the end of an hour, he goes, "All right, then, are we good?" And I went, "Well, we're we're pretty good." And he left. Cut to this manager, who I assume was a relatively new manager, called me like a few weeks later, and had Van had a record coming out. I think it was not the record you uh, love so much, but it was close to that. It was, I think it was Hymns to, the, Hymns to the Silence. He goes, Van wanted to know if you'd write some liner notes for him. And I said, why would he ask me? He goes, he said you guys get along. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is what it means to get along well with Van. And even you mentioned the Astral Weeks uh, show that he did. He did a little tour. And a couple of years ago, uh, I got a call going, Van's going to do uh, like one interview to promote this, and he'll only do it with you, David. And he said, because you guys are friends. So this is my friendship with Van Morrison. And that is the my story about Van. Oh, that's a fantastic story. So th this is so interesting. So you probably are one of his one of his good friends in his mind. Until he hears this podcast, uh, I'm yeah. probably oh, his don't favorite worry journalist. About that. Yeah. That's probably not going <laughs> to happen. That's never caused anybody any problems. <laughs> no, but but so it really had to come down to you kind of pretending you're a therapist. Well, the thing is that I what I later heard, and I don't know, I, I like this theory, is that he, what he did was he agreed to one interview in England and one interview in America. In England, he picked Spike Milligan, who's a famous old comedian, I think, yeah. for the Goonies or something like no, that. No, yeah, yeah. He and Peter Sellers and somebody else were, were like the, yeah, they were a famous comedy team, right. like on radio. And he liked Spike, like, you know, I guess, uh, and what I also later found out was, 
he was a lot more sane than around really pretty women. I think hmm. it might, he was only probably coherent and pleasant when erect. Uh, so I think he might have been a mistake for him to do interviews with men. But Spike Milligan. You're joking. Uh, no, he was he was much more sane in my dealings when but there were women. Why wouldn't he around. have? I'm that's surprising then that his label wouldn't have recognized they, that. Maybe anything. they were afraid of him being too friendly. I don't I know. See, I see. But in any yeah, case, yeah, the story would be. I was chased through Harvard Square by, by Van, Van Morrison. Exactly. To, I chased Harvard, yeah, chased uh, Van Morrison. Exactly. So I think what happened was I later was told, I think maybe by Peter Wolf, that Van reacted weirdly to me because he assumed I was – like Spike Milligan was like his age, and he thought yeah. I was going to be his age. And then I was 26, and like he was like – a kid. It was a kid because I, I had sort of had this you know quick rise at Rolling Stone. So that may have been – one of the things that freaked him out, but I don't think it took much to make him uh, freaked out. And then the last time I spoke to him about Astral Weeks when he was doing that tour, we had just it was just a phone call. He called me, and it was great. I mean, it was really a great talk, and I got some window into why he is the way he is. And I was talking about an early sort of producer of his and a record executive, and I think – he, you know, he sings like one of the old blues men, and I think part of the reason is he's one of the few like white guys of his era who was screwed over like the way the blues men were. So wow. I think he felt burnt and ripped off, and is utterly suspicious and utterly on guard. And I've met a few or a lot of artists that way, but him in an extreme way, I think he assumes everyone is out to screw him over, and that's how he goes deals with. So things. he's in fear. I but think some, yeah. some of this sounds to me, and I'm always obsessing mental illness onto people, but that's my, like I say, I have crazy dar, you know. And it's like, there's, some of this is just like, it's like if he wasn't famous and that incredibly talented, people just wouldn't be putting up with this behavior. And he'd have to like go to a real therapist or get on medication or something. It's like, just, but because he is who he is, it's like, it. It might occur to most people, I'd like to just walk out of this room right now. But well, he'll actually do it. Well, I I have a theory, and I my two favorite guys, maybe three favorite guys of my like teen years were Van Morrison, Bob Dylan, Neil Young. And my experiences with, with each of them are kind of instructive. And I kind of respect all of them more than most rock stars who've made a sort of professional – life of being charming for media i right. i sort of respect someone the artist yeah it, true and you know i think he might do it to a fault in my experience it was kind of to a fault but i think i i the people who do not have any interest in the bullshit of modern media yeah uh, bob dylan i dealt with in a really he's my probably my greatest hero and i had an experience with him that was really really fascinating where I had been the head writer for the Tribute to Heroes after 9-11, and he called me in with an idea for a TV project that he wow. wanted me to work with him on. Wow. And so it was not an interview. I'd written right. liner notes for him, and I'd been around him as a journalist a little yeah, bit. But yeah. this was in a different way meeting with him. And, in fact, he was coming from an interview with Rolling Stone. What city were you in? We were in L.A., and it was at a hotel, which is – that's what a troubadour he is. He was yeah. he stays in a hotel even in his own hometown. <laughs> uh, but he, he came in – he I was in his room before he was. He came in from this other room where he was doing an interview or somewhere else. And the first thing he said to me was, ah, oh, David, fucking interviews. <laughs> and I went – uh, and I go, what do you mean? He goes, people still asking me why I went electric. How interesting. <laughs> and I thought, that's what life is like for Dylan, yeah. for yeah. McCartney. It's like there's still the eight questions that everyone has. And they from hear it from every four decades yes, ago. It's really frustrating, I'm sure, for them because it's like if you wanted to know that, then why didn't you listen to begin with to the thousand other interviews I did? Right. And, and if you are a true artist, which Bob Dylan is, which yeah. Van Morrison is, I think they really are. They are in the here and now, and the way our media is set up, the way our culture is set up, the people who are interested in talking to them, they're always being forced to talk about things that couldn't interest them It's really less. unfortunate because, you no, know, I find when I have people on StoryWorthy, I look back into the person pretty heavy in pre-production, and I try very hard not to ask the same questions that they're going to be asked a thousand times because I can see that them gloss over in their face, and they don't even want to be here. Uh, and I feel terrible about that. Absolutely. In fact, Neil Young, who I think from listening to the show, you're a Neil Young fan, Huge. right? Okay. Are you, I don't know if you like Neil I, Young No, I like Neil Young very much. She, again, would like to have a three-way with Rafael Nadal and Neil Young. Uh, those are... T- 
I would with those options. two as well. I'd I love watch. those two. I'm not saying I wouldn't watch. I Hannes isn't him. a big music fan. Oh, I'm a no, tennis. But I, I do, I, I'm a I tennis know how and good, Neil Young fan. So I know that, how good he is. Yes. I, under even I know how good he is. Well, then here's uh, this is the years probably ninety. It's ninety something when he reunited with Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Yeah. For American, no, not American Dream. For Looking Forward or yeah, this is the last time they did a. Not one of the last times, but one of their last sort of reunions. Right. And I was asked to do an interview with them for a documentary on Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, but then to squeeze in a separate solo documentary interview with him. And it was like, cover Neil Young's career and the career of Crosby, Stills & Young, and he'll give you an hour. Or he'll give me, he'll give me I think you're supposed to give me three hours. Whoa. After five minutes, I, I'm sorry, five minutes before the interview, I'm told, okay, you'll have like 15 minutes to do all of it. Wow. And I thought... I'm in trouble here. I just can't cover this. In I just can't be done. And further, VH1 wanted me to ask one question that I felt in, very uncomfortable. They really wanted. They said you need. He needs to comment on his kids who were being educated at the Bridge School, the Bridge Benefit right. that he does. Right. And basically, I felt they wanted me to ask some exploitative questions about his kids. And. I said, I can't, I'll find, I'll try to find some way to ask him about the kids, but I'm not going to do it in a way I find disrespectful to him or the kids. I just won't do it. And I, right before the interview, like all this, there was all this pressure and I knew I had to get that. I had to get something. That was like their mission. And so I said, and I knew I was in trouble with the time I had. So the first question I said was, I just, came, I'd been to the bridge benefit many times. And I said, I want to ask you a question about your kids. And, you know, he looked up like, this is a guy who quit, I think, Buffalo Springfield because he didn't want to be on camera, you know, and he thinks he has, I think he's the only non-American Indian who believes it steals your soul, but he, they, the Indians might be onto something about that. Yeah. And so I said, what have you learned from your kids? And he went from looking like he wanted to kill me yeah, to like all like, of a sudden he was like, great question. Oh, I can, I can say something that's New, not putting, fresh, that's original. not, that's not condescending to my children. That is, yeah. re, you know, realizing what they have brought to his life and yeah. what they've, how, how they've informed his work. And then he gave me the time I needed. Uh, and he was great, but you could tell I was one question away from disaster. Like, uh, him walking out. Oh, yeah. and I had that, Absolutely. uh, and I'll I'll shut up in a minute, but like, <laughs> yeah, that's why we had you here. Okay, <laughs> but, like, shut up. but like one of my other more <laughs> fascinating, weird interviews was I was at home with my wife and kids, and I got a call in the middle of like maybe eleven fifteen, eleven thirty, saying, "Get to Disney now." This is from Rolling Stone, hmm. uh, and I said, "What do you mean get to Disney now?" He goes, "You're interviewing Johnny Depp and Keith Richards now. Go now." And I'm like, "This is not the way it works." I mean, I grabbed, you know, at this point, I guess my uh, iPhone, or, and I drove there, but I didn't know what was happening. I got outside the trailer. They were filming key scenes with Johnny for Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. And what had happened was another journalist had been assigned to do the piece, and he walked in, and his first question to Keith Richards, in there sitting in Johnny's trailer, and he goes, looks at Keith's ring, which is a skull ring, which he's worn forever. And he goes, is that a prop they gave you to make you look like a pirate? And Keith immediately was like, you don't know who I am. Yeah, get out. At which point the, ner the journalist got nervous because Keith Richards was giving him the look of death. And his second question was, will you guys arm wrestle? I want to see who's tougher. <laughs> at which point Keith Richards, as I am told by – this is – I was told this by – Johnny Depp's sister, I think, who was his, there. What I think he said was he picked up a banana from the fruit <laughs> tray and said, if you don't get the fuck out of this trailer right now, I'm going to shove this banana up your ass until you bleed to death. <laughs> at which point the journalist ran out, I think, in tears. At which point a call was made to Rolling Stone. At which point I was called. <laughs> at which point... We need to get the next interview. Yeah. 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 I, and they knew that I had written the liner notes for the Stones for 40 Licks. I did not know Keith. I knew Mick. A little bit, but I did not know Keith <laughs> other than yeah. a faxing, getting a quote or something like that. I walked in and Keith's first words to me literally were, would you like a banana? Because <laughs> he and I, my first question was something that made him think I knew and loved him, which I do. And we were he was great. Couldn't what was your nicer. first question? Uh, I think uh, I think I might have said something just as a casual thing as I was walking yeah. in. Uh I, I said, well, 
you know, I think they said to Johnny, you, I didn't know there were pirates before Keith Richards, you yeah. know, or something like that. And he was my first pirate. Something that made him feel understood. And yeah. that's like, I think that's half the thing is that. I think Johnny Depp actually mirrored his character after Keith Richards. Oh, yeah, no, 100%. Right. He said yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He did uh, say that, yeah. yeah. No, no. So that was, it, it all went well. And in fact, I had written liner notes for 40 Licks and uh, Mick Jagger had personally negotiated my deal which you don't want to do with a London School of Economics, you know, economics major, because yeah. he's he's super economical, you might say. So literally, you have Mick Jagger going. I was at this was like on a, I think it was Thursday night. I got a call saying, uh, David Love, and I'd only like met him a yeah. few times. That he was not like, a, but oh, he's and your I'm love all right. and I'm straight. But yeah. when Mick Jagger says David, David Love, I was like, yeah. oh, this is great. And yeah. he goes, could we have some liner notes uh, for Friday? And I'm like, sure, whatever you want. Tell goes, us what it means to write liner notes. It's an essay that goes on some albums, usually compilations or re- retrospectives. And he, it was 40 Licks, which was their big career double CD collection that became a smash. And he asked me to write the liner notes. And he, and he said Friday. And I was like, sure, not realizing it was Thursday night. Wow. So I, oh I literally Tonight, went into, I, I put on uh, not an album that everyone loves, but I love called Black and Blue. And I sat and knocked it out. And sent it to had a, and, and at that point it was faxing. Uh, I had to fax it to Keith and fax it to Mick, and I got <laughs> how exciting. Uh, oh, but I, I negotiated my deal with Mick on the phone, which was really not a lot of money. I would have done it for nothing, uh, but I did say I want two tickets to any show I want, no. and I want you to sign a copy of this record. I never got it signed until when Mick came to the Grammys, because I write the Grammys. That's yeah. what I, I mainly do is write TV shows now. When Mick came to the Grammys, I got him to sign it. And then when I was with Keith at the uh, uh, in the in Johnny's room, I got him to sign it. So I, That's I, finally, fantastic. I finally made my... So I, yeah. a couple of things, David. You have written for the Grammy Awards ever since 2000, the year 2000. You've written for the Grammy Awards for 15 years. Yeah. And you also write for the Emmy Awards and the Academy Awards. I've written for all of them. I'm the Jewish trifecta. Or something yeah, like that. I see. And uh, it just your Zionist trifecta. I just can't get over your body of work. I mean, really, it's so exciting because you're almost like from the movie Almost Famous. I'm not nearly famous. They're going to make the, the sequel. No, Cameron was is a friend. Yeah. And I always say that to him. It's like he hit it when everyone was high and when there were groupies everywhere. I hit it. You know, just enough time later that it was all rehab and you yeah, know. you were dealing with people in their forties and fifties getting their lives together, right? And, and so in nineteen ninety, um, you're how old? Uh, twenty seven. He said twenty seven. Twenty six, I think it says here. And I looked and, it up in the magazine. It said I said I was twenty six. That's how, how you know you're old. Van you start Morrison looking up your that? at that time. How old was Van Morrison? Older than me. I, I think he's probably another 15 years old. Had you me. read about him before you went to meet him? Did you know ahead of time it was going to be a really tough interview? Yeah, well, you there's people you know are not going to be easy. My, I think about Lou Reed is another one. Uh, I hosted a show on Bravo called Musicians for Two Seasons, and that w- our, our first show was Lou Reed, which is like someone said that's like starting, uh, <laughs> you know, starting on the bottom because he's famously he was famously difficult, and yeah. he was a total prick for the first twenty minutes of the interview. Like literally wouldn't answer a thing, and then I said one thing about doo wop, and it. He loved me, and literally, Isn't that interesting? And yeah. And and years later, uh, literally, it went from like he was the worst interview to he would not leave. We did two a day interviews, and he wouldn't leave the studio. He wanted to he said, "Can I do another one?" He loved it so much. And then when he uh, years later, like uh, a new interview on a different topic. Yeah, he just wanted to keep filming okay. more and okay. do another show. And then when uh, years later, I'm in New York. We did the Grammys in New York for the only time in those 15 years. We did the Grammys in New York, and at the last second, the first award was supposed to be presented by Justin Timberlake, who I work with all the time, who I love, and I realized. He's nominated in the category. We can't have him present this award. Yeah. So we had to pull together two people to present the first award yeah. who would be decent enough to get a reaction. And I, uh, Ken Ehrlich and I, who's executive producer, said we knew that Dave Grohl was there. And yeah. he's always great. So we got yeah. Dave Grohl. And then I said, well, we're in New York. So let's acknowledge that and get Lou Reed, who's as you – don't, you don't have Bruce uh, yeah. available to do this, but we could get Lou Reed. And uh, so I asked Lou Reed to do it. And on stage at the Grammys – he grabbed me and kissed me on the lips. The only man besides my dad who's ever kissed me on my lips was Lou Reed because on our show, 
it was performance and interview show. Yeah. You could only have one musician. And Lou said, you saved me a million dollars because you taught me I could do some gigs with just one or two guys. <laughs> and he loved me for that. For wow. Oh, that's great. It Can seems I... like these guys have to like, they get a respect for you. They they wait. To, well, once they respect you, then they're, they're in your pocket. Well, and that's the great cool. thing is there's people, once you earn yeah. that respect, Often, like, uh, I do right. a million things with Ringo Starr because he trusts me so that well, if he has yeah, to do like something. Like you said about Keith Ridge, like, that guy didn't know who the fuck he was. Right. And you, your pirate thing, you knew who he was. It's like, do you know who I am? Right. Am I always, and that seems to be the thing that triggers them. Like, doo important to Lou Reed. Right. A moron wouldn't know that. You're smart. You do know that. Well, what I think it is, is, and thank you for saying that, but I think part of it is like, as opposed to like you guys in a podcast kind of universe, the world that a lot of these people have had to travel in in the media world is the sort of like anchor people, or I mean, the, you know, the entertainment journalists who are pretty enough to be on TV, who who don't know what they're talking about, who yep. are handed a few questions, and who often they they they're sick of that. They're, yeah, and they're, they're sitting they're in one room. Uh, I forgot what it's called. They sit. And journalists oh, satellite come in, tour yeah, come in like oh, 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Next one comes in, and they're all asking the same question. So it's like 45 times a day, they're literally hearing the same ignorant question. Oh, junk it. Yeah, okay, so junk David, it. how you. do you prepare for an interview? Uh, well, I don't do as many interviews. Like, uh, I have to do uh, – today is – well – in the next two days or three days, I have to do two interviews with John Fogarty at the Grammy Museum for an event. And he just said, can you do Barnes & Noble? And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's a hard one because I'm going to have to – I have – I always have the questions that I really care about. And I've done – I did a three-hour interview with him in front of an audience like two years ago. So that becomes a little tricky. I said, I'm going to have to divide this into like yeah. what am I going to focus on here and what am I going to focus on here? But in general... Because you're thinking about the audience. Yes. Because the Barnes & Noble is like at the Grove. It's like in the shopping area. Is yeah, that what you Yeah, mean? it's at the store. Right. Like, and he's going to sign and there's going to be an event where right. hundreds of people will be there, right. hopefully. Uh, and then the Grammy Museum is in a theater. Right. Uh, but in general, I have learned that the secret... And my son just started... Uh, as a college journalist. So he actually asked me, I just went to Parents Weekend last weekend for the first time at Berkeley. Wow. And he said, what's this, what What do you do in an interview? And I said, ask the question you actually care about. And that will be, that's the entire thing. If yeah. you, if you are, because that's the anti, antithesis of what entertainment news, happy news journalists do is they just ask something that's on a card. If you want to have a conversation, ask the question you really care well, about. Well, and also, if you are interested at all, read what they already wrote or and, and right. find out about them and so that you have a more in, more of an insight. Yes, and that works. I, I find that works about 80% of the time. Sometimes that will trigger the, that was a misquote, you know, yeah. kind of thing. You can yeah. get that. Uh, but in general, I just think you have to ask real questions. Yeah. That's what so um, what's the most nervous you ever got? The most nervous I've ever been... Uh, being in the White House, uh, I have such a reverence. I, I'm sort of music has sort of been the dominant thing in my life, but I'm also like fascinated by American history. So the first time I wrote at the White House, I wrote an event with Clinton. I literally, and I went once with Bush, the last weeks of the Bush administration. I was pushed into a room with George Bush, who's not my president, and Dan Quayle. But I will say, you no, know, even so with Clinton, who I did have a lot of interest in and being around Obama on a few events, I get the most nervous when I'm in around an American president because I literally, A, there's Secret yeah. Service walking around you. That makes it a little bit more intimidating. But other than that, it's uh, Beatles. Uh, uh, the first time I met Paul McCartney and Linda, who became a friend, she took my author's picture. No she was the greatest kidding. lady. I mean, she was the best. Uh, she ta- she she forced me to marry my wife. Wow. I would not I would not be married. How did you meet Paul and Linda? Uh, I was on the road with them for about it ended up being like weeks. I went to South America with them and around the West. And but it be, uh, at the end of all that, we were in New Jersey at the like Brendan Byrne Arena or whatever it was called then, the big arena. He was playing the football stadium. And my I, a girl I just started dating was in New York by coincidence. And Linda, at the end of this whole tour, said, are you dating anyone? And like, I don't know if, maybe I made a huge mistake. She was going to fix me up with her daughter. But she goes, I said, yeah, I just met a girl. She goes, I want to meet her. And I said, well, she's actually in town. She goes, bring her to lunch tomorrow. And I went, you mean like before sound check? And she goes, yeah. So that's a hell of a like fifth date to oh call and say, gosh. you want to come and have lunch with Linda McCartney? <laughs> oh my and uh, so right. she came 
and they ha- we had lunch. And at the end of it, where she, were you eating lunch? In the in the catering area, the vegetarian catering I was area. Say, oh. I was going to ask about the yeah, no meat. Oh, I went to Argentina with the McCartneys, and the capital of beef. You do not want to be with the McCartneys because yeah. you're not enjoying any of the uh, great great <laughs> steak. But the food was good, and the company was great. She was totally misunderstood. A, an unbelievably warm, great human being, and they were a real love story. And I come from like a divorce, and I, I I didn't have that many great marriage examples. They were great. But why do you example. think she was so misunderstood? I mean, I always thought that they were like a true romance, like a, an amazing. Well, people, oh, I mean, like a John Lennon Yoko Ono way. That, people blaming Yoko and her, you know that that. Yeah, thing. and saying why is she part of the band when she? Why does not... she sing with Paul? No, but this why is way she... past that, right? This is with you're just with this Paul is, and Linda. Yeah, yeah, but no, but I think those issues. Some people still. Have a negative vibe, but we're like that. We came to see Paul McCartney. We didn't come to see Linda McCartney. Well, but she, but was, she was part of Wings, and yes. that's who you were with, right? Yeah, yeah. no, it was not Wings. This was this was this after was Wings. This was uh, just Paul touring on his own. This is the end, but she, she hasn't stopped. In the band. And, and she was in the, yeah. his band. Uh-huh. She stayed with him. Right. She was yeah. the only Wing. I think if you marry, you get to <laughs> stay in the band. Single, single Wing. They went in a circle the whole time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Can I ask you? You mentioned very uh, just before that you had interviewed Jack Nicholson for yes. Rolling Stone, which is probably the interview I remember reading. But then you said he called you later oh, and no, asked I, you. I wrote for him a few times and uh, wrote with him, which was because people forget he was started out as a writer. You know, he was a writer. Yeah. For no, like, I didn't realize. Yeah, that. for like. He Roger wrote the Corman movie and head. head for the monkeys. In fact, for the monkeys. Oh, in fact, my wife had bought me for my birthday, and this was somehow one of these times was around my birthday. She would bought me this portrait of him with the monkeys on the set of Head, and I brought it with me. I think he signed it for me, but uh, yeah, the most amazing thing was when he asked me to write with him at the house, and it was like I talked to him on the phone by this point many times, but I'd never. Yeah. This is okay, you know, I interviewed him after I wrote for him. Okay. So I wrote for him first, but it mainly was I'd written some things with him over the phone and they goes, You gotta come to the house. And it was the most amazing experience of my life because I'll never forget his assistant uh said don't worry, because I look probably a little nervous about to go up to his house in his little compound. Yeah, yeah. Mulholland there, yeah. I don't want to say, but uh well, everybody said, yeah. knows he lives yeah. on Mulholland. But yeah. he said uh he said um she goes. He's every. She said he's every character you ever loved, wow. which was a hundred percent true. It's like because as a, such a fan, if you, uh, yeah, obviously yeah. you're a fan, he literally. There's moments when you go, oh my god, I'm in Carnal Knowledge. Oh my god, I'm in. <laughs> you know, it's like every movie that you know. I, I'm in Cuckoo's Nest. I'm in every different movie because oh. he he'll give you little shadings of it. Like at one point he goes. David, what do these women want from us? And I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, I was so happy. Then I said, yeah, you. exactly. Yeah, I said, yeah, I'm pretty like, sure. I, that... I know what they want from you. <laughs> yeah, it ain't what they want from me. Uh, <laughs> but those were like those are the moments. He was, and he was fantastic and a great writer and made me like just that little. That was like one day of writing like. Back, going back and forth at the house on something. And David, it's just incredulous the <laughs> way you have crossed boundaries between musicians and actors and presidents. I mean, it's just, how it, do you even get your head around your life? No, my, and my kids now, you know, my son is just at college and I'll occasionally have conversations where they go, hold on. I know, like when we I'm did, trying to figure like when, out. You know, and like, they go like when... And, you know, because early on, it was like they were more impressed with, like, Justin Timberlake would call to write a speech or something. Yeah. And we were, that was cool to them. But now it's like they go, Hold, what was my first concert? And I'm like, you were three and one. And uh, we were at dinner. And I got a call. I had to go to a Fleetwood Mac rehearsal. Their first concert was a private concert. I can't take They it. were the only people there with my wife and I, I remember it really well because uh, Mick Fleetwood and John McVie came out and scooped them ice cream during. Oh my god! Like they took a intermission during the <laughs> rehearsal. Will you and adopt me? Yes. Will yes, you marry exactly. me? And, yes. and little and hips, either time way. machine. So. I want to be in your life. It's a very no. And there's times when like yeah, I just was in New York with the Pope, and then uh, <laughs> came back for three days and went back to meet with Carrie Underwood and Brad Paisley. And I'm like, this is a weird life. Well, I just you Chris, have wait, an Christine, incredible I just life. have to mention the, the connection between you. Look at his hat. I know. I'm He's looking wearing at your hat. He's wearing hat. a walk-hard hat. Her Dewey ex-husband Cox. was a gaffer yeah. <laughs> on walk-hard. We're just looking at your hat, the Dewey Cox oh, story. I love that show. I did. Her, her husband I, worked on that movie. I didn't know that. I well, maybe I would might have I might have seen him. It's not important. Oh, no. I work. Uh, I've done some stuff with Judd Apatow and... Yeah. Uh, 
I was th- that greatest thing he ever asked me to do. Well, he gave me a cameo. I had nine words in a yarmulke from behind, and this is forty. But that was good because that actually came with some checks. But uh, he ga- he went for Walk Hard, which I love. Yes, yeah, so I. Too. I just love it. He called me and goes, "Will you write?" box set liner notes wow. for Dewey Cox and I went I love to I and if you I, you can't find it maybe online someone could buy it for a million dollars there was a box of Cox a full That's box really set of, of this imaginary fictional, fictional character, character. Yeah. Dewey and Cox. then the greatest part for me was I wrote these notes I really loved them uh, and then they called me and said Will you do an audio, like an NPR recording of your liner notes? Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and Judd and, uh, and Jake Kasdan directed me recording my liner notes. And so I literally, at a microphone Hilarious. like this, read yeah. these notes that were sort of like pseudo-NPR. You must have been laughing God, so hard. I loved hard. it. I loved it. It's somewhere in my computer. I think I still have I could have talk that. to you all day. I have so many questions for you. And unfortunately, we can't talk all day. But let me just ask you this. What's the best concert you ever saw? I mean, that's hard to say because I know it depends on the venue and the year and the time. But what what really sticks out? The things that stick out, uh, I was once covering the opening of a Prince tour in Paris. And at the end of the night, the show ends at one. He has a party on a little private island at like two. And he goes, Kurt Loder and I were together. Uh, We were both covering it for, he was for MTV. He goes, I'm going to play later tonight. So he, of course, like he always has played like a three or four o'clock show on the Champs de Lisey, uh, which was amazing, and that was the greatest show I ever saw. Outside, yes. outside on the Champs de Lisey. No, no, in a club in the in basement. Club, I see. Le Ban Douche, I think it's called. But that was one of the greatest ever. Because also, I remember the show ended at like six o'clock, and I walked out up the stairs, and the sun is coming up oh, in Paris, God. and I'm like, yeah. "This is a good job. This is a good life." Uh, also, the Beatles, the Grammy Beatles tribute, which I got nominated for, which I loved doing, was an experience of just like all these other musicians who I liked. You were the head writer. That was in 2001? No, that was that was Tribute to oh, Heroes. 2014. Yeah, that, that was, was just a couple, recent. Yeah, that was just a year or two ago. And that was an amazing experience because you're literally with the guys who invented the reason you love rock and roll. And yeah. I mean, I'm not of the Elvis. I didn't. In fact, it was great for me because it was like honoring the Ed Sullivan, uh, you know, the anniversary. And I, in fact, don't remember the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. I'm too young f- yeah. Yeah. for that. But I do remember the end of the Beatles. I do. My first memories are like the White Album being in my o- older brother's uh, collection. Yeah. So that was a big moment. No doubt. And then just real quick, you also though, did some funnier things. I think early in your career, like you wrote the best-selling book called Friends, the official companion. I was the seventh ugly friend. So, uh, <laughs> I still when am. You the write ugly. a book about Friends, yes. the official companion. You got to know that show. Well, the best thing for me was. The reason I wrote that was I did a cover story for Rolling Stone about Friends at the end of the first season. The show exploded, and the cast negotiated all this control. Yeah. And the cast said, the Warner Brothers said, we're doing a book, and they said, we're only doing it if this guy writes it, because we like that Damn article. It. Amazing. No, so then the best thing was, at the end of the show, I had kids, you know, I had young kids. I hadn't watched every episode. I loved the show, but I didn't watch it all. I, they then you, yeah. what happened was Warner Brothers made a deal to do a coffee table book yeah. at the end of the show and the cast said we're only doing it with this guy they did not tell me that so they offered me the same money and ah. I said no and they had to in the end they had to give me an equal share with the friends which here's a business bit for writers if you can ever be an equal partner with cast members in anything do it because the great thing about that is people like us don't have the money to Go to Warner Brothers and say, yeah. "We're gonna do, we're gonna do a uh, yeah. a fiscal uh, search for what money there is." So I ended up in the middle of the writer strike, getting the only six figure check I've ever gotten because they've got power because they had power That's and fantastic, lawyers. So man. thank you, David Schwimmer, for having two Amazing. lawyer parents. And hey, listen, you want to play some shotgun story worthy? Sure. Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! I landed on mom. Oh boy. This is a big issue. Uh, <laughs> uh, my mo- how many how much time do I have? You have one minute. Okay, uh, my mother the said the nicest thing I ever said to her is that I she reminded me of Joni Mitchell, uh, <laughs> and she thought it was her voice. I just thought she had the same hairstyle. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's it? Yeah, that's the story. That's your story about your mom? Well, for a minute. I mean, I hey, have so listen, many issues. I could be in a therapy seconds. couch. That okay. was fantastic. It could, it could go on for... Where do your parents live? Uh, my dad lives nowhere anymore, but he lived in uh, in New Jersey, and he was... Uh, he was they were they're both great people, both really good writers, which maybe there's some, I'm not saying I'm good, but my mom wrote like Fitzgerald, my dad wrote like Hemingway, so I somehow landed somewhere in the middle. Wow. And you're not, not not Ernest Hemingway, Irving Hemingway. Bob, and uh, Bob Hemingway and uh, Jed Fitzgerald. Yeah, exactly. Your a... kids are so lucky to get to learn from you and to watch your life and career. It's just fantastic. I will show you a picture that makes it illustrates that uh, when we're done of them at the Beatles show with Paul McCartney, who oh. this is the last story. If, if you have time yeah. for this last story, we're backstage. My kids are coming to visit and they always come at during they only visit me during the Grammys because it's a fun scene. No kidding. And they came backstage and my wife had this look of like shock. And she said, look at this. And Paul McCartney had gone up to uh, to my kids, and and he was listen. Paul McCartney does not rush to take pictures right. with people. Everyone's trying to get it. He has yeah. a security guard and all that. But in the middle of the hallway, he goes, "Boys, I need a picture with you." Wow. And Linda, who had ordered me to marry my wife, and it's probably the only reason they those kids <laughs> exist. I f- somehow felt it was her spirit, and this picture is on my phone. That's my default picture on my she phone. She was an angel. She was an angel. Oh, that's no amazing. doubt. What did you name your daughter? I don't know. Two sons, Andrew. Oh, two sons. Andrew, like Andrew over here. Uh, Andrew Dillon, after Dillon, which I Very mentioned nice. to him. Very uh, nice. uh, and actually, Jacob Dillon once said to me, after me, I'm going, no, no, after, after the old man. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and uh, uh, and uh, Alex Scott after Scott Fitzgerald, who oh, is my favorite writer. Fantastic! Hey, man, I can't thank you enough for coming yes, thank over you. here today. Thank really. you, my pleasure. It's a big deal. I love Anytime the show. We back, we I do want you to change it. the name of the show, though. Okay, okay. Well, what would you thing, like that to be called? I just I think you need to brand not Christine. I think your name is a problem. Oh Honest yeah, oh, it's a problem. Mm-hmm. I think it should be Christine and the man. Like <laughs> it's like Chico and the man, That's and you're ah. the man. And it could be because you have that European thing. It could be two ends, like man. Like, well, it could no, be like, I was gonna say it, it, I'm Ger- my mother's German, so der man, der man. So Christine und der, und der man, und der man. Is that how it <laughs> plays in uh, the German podcast market? Yes, yes, the German podcast market, which is a little deviant. Yes. I'm just going to say. <laughs> All right, you guys, we got to wrap it up right about now. I want to thank everybody here at Sideshow Network, including Andrew Steven. Thanks, Andrew. And, of course, Sean Merrick and Roddy Swearingen. And on behalf of John Thomas Griffith, you know, he's the guy. Speaking of music, he wrote the He's never song, been interviewed by David Wilde. I, I don't want to hear about him. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank, of course, you, David Wilde. Oh, my really. pleasure. What a, Great what a to privilege be here. to have you in yes, here. Yes, thank you. So Am I story worthy? I've just always you wanted to so be. You are so story worthy. You are beyond worthy. I so worthy. appreciate your body of work i'm just you are diet coke excited. worthy i will get you a diet coke <laughs> that, sir. and on behalf ultimate. of you honey, my drug you, my dear friend and co-host my name is christine blackburn saying make it a story worthy week you can Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Your favorite band's about to play a sold-out show. You got in. Over here. With a friend. And found a spot close enough to see the set list. They're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Progressive is America's number one motorcycle insurer, so we understand motorcycles. No, really. We have a bike translator. Okay, so this bike says she is struggling with her place in the motorcycle community. Well, she says she hasn't peaked yet, but she's having a little epiphany. Okay. Oh, that maybe life itself is the peak. Hmm, interesting. In my experience, I found that... Oh, so I just translate. Not allowed to have opinions. Got it. Quote with Progressive and see if you could save with America's number one motorcycle insurer. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Hey, Scott. What brings you in at the pharmacy? I'm thinking about getting one of the updated COVID-19 vaccines. Great. Do you know which type of vaccine you'd like? There's more than one. Yep. There are different types of vaccines available. 
You can learn more about them at wedovaccines.com. If you have questions or want to make an appointment, give me a call. What was that website again? wedovaccines.com. Thanks. I'll check it out. This message was brought to you by Novavax.